Well, hey, thank you everyone for, uh, for showing up on a Wednesday evening. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the pizza and pop. Um, we are uh, we're here representing uh, Mechanical Contractors of America Association, Association of America, excuse me. And uh, Reed is sort of our Western Pennsylvania uh, director, and so uh, he set, set this up for us. Nathan Wood is out of Denver, and uh, we'll be giving us a great speech on uh, building information modeling, right, and uh, other design aspects. So uh, I'll leave the floor to Reed. Thanks, Tony. Uh, before we get going, a little background on us before I introduce Nathan to everybody. Uh, we are out here to start a student chapter. We started it a little bit late last year, and we're trying to get things going in the right direction to bring young students, engineering students, mechanical engineering students into our industry. Project managership, uh, internships, working for our custom uh, contractors. Our big contractors, uh, you probably see them around campus, uh, Ruth Ruff, Sire, McCamish, Power Piping. Maybe some of the names are Greek to you, but we do major projects, cogen plants, so cracker plant will be a big project that we're going to do down here. We'll probably have 1,200 fitters working in that job within the next 12 to 14 months. Uh, we do uh, schools, high-rise, uh, universities. Uh, we have project labor agreements at most universities in the city of Pittsburgh, Pitt, Carnegie Mellon. Do a lot of work at Robert Morris here. So what our goal is, there's uh, 43 student chapters across the United States. Okay, and I approached Tony and Maria and Tony uh, was kind enough to let us set up the student chapter right here. We got going a little late, but there's 43 chapters, like I say, across the United States. And the closest one here is Penn State up in the main campus. And the other is Ohio State over here. So it's really great that we have the Pittsburgh area and Robert Moore's and students that want to stay in the Pittsburgh area. You know, we looked at uh, Pitt, Pitt's uh, related to general contractors. Uh, and we're mechanicals, like I say, piping contractors. And uh, it originally started out with a, a mix of general contractors, uh, mechanical contractors and electrical contractors at Pitt, but the program fell into the hands of the big general contractors. So they took us off the slate and said, we gotta go elsewhere and find, set something up. Unbeknownst to me at the time, I didn't know that we had a national organization with student chapters. So what we did last year, Tony set up officers here, uh, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer. We had three or four meetings, met with Maria, met with uh, Sue Spade in her class for a year last year, um, touched the BIM systems and different things of what we do. We're very high tech, a uh, lot of design and build work. We do uh, planning specification, design and build. We work with all the big Bechtels, floors, Black and Beach, we work with all the big construction companies. Uh, design work's done by Michael Baker. We do a lot of projects in coordination with Michael Baker with these companies. Again, the Cracker Plan, as I said down there, is being done by Bechtel out of Houston, Texas, and that'll be all our guys doing that. Um, so what we're trying to do here is get not only internships, but we have other things connected with the National Association. Uh, we have projects that if you develop a team of eight, 10 guys, or students, ladies, and you, you come together and we get this thing rolling down the road. Uh, there's national conventions where we literally compete against the 43 other universities that are part of it. Now this is a ways down the road, that could be wrong, but it's really hands-on stuff. Uh, for example, this year the contest will be in San Antonio, Texas, and we take the whole group of eight to 10 kids down to San Antonio. If you're elected one of the 10 finalists and you compete for a week, on a project that's given by a mechanical contractor to do piping system of a big building, a cogen plant, a process plant, or something to this effect. And it, it's really exciting stuff. But again, that's down the road. Uh, we've approached uh, Maria and Tony about curriculums that relate more to our industry. That's something we've got to work on, uh, more geared into our mechanical contracting. Uh, you do have a lot of programs that coincide here at the university with what you have. And again, like I say, we were late last year, we still put five uh, students into internships, and two of them are staying with our contractors now. So it's a big start. Uh, and these contractors do anything, uh, like I say, from dollar-wise, from 50 million a year, as much as 200 million a year. So depending on where the work is and what's generated in our area, we go, uh, my big contractors will go as far as five or six states, because they're big, they go out and get the big work. 
smaller contractor state in the 15 county, the 33 county area that go over as far as uh, Three Mile Island in Harrisburg, up as far as Erie, and down into Beaver Falls. So we have all different kinds, like I say, 46 contractors. We need to do a lot of work to keep everybody busy. So with that being said, we're hoping that this program gets rolling here. Uh, we've got a whole year to work with, and Tony's going to be the faculty advisor. He's, got, he's a dynamic guy, and he's really been working with me real close. And uh, like I say, Sue was kind enough to let us speak to her class for a full eight-hour period, and that went real well. So now that we get the lay of the land and we figured everything out last year, we're going to get officers, we're going to get uh, meetings, we're going to get other tours, uh, and get this thing going in the right direction so we can compete on a national level down the road. Everything takes time, but uh, I think we can do it. And the beauty part about this, about Robert Morris and Maria and Tony both told me, 85% of you students are from the area and you stay in the area. And that's what we're looking for, students to stay in our geographical area and work for us. Construction's a night, we, we don't know, it's, it's also an old industry. Uh, we've got a lot of old timers, that's why I brought a guy in here like Nathan to talk to you guys. One of the old timers just walked in with the glasses, Kenny Moreno. He's a Notre Dame grad, but you know, he got gray hair like me. And uh, we're looking for young people to get involved in our industry. Uh, it's a great industry. I've been around the industry for 40 years. Kenny's been around the industry 40 years. Tremendous Living was an owner of a big construction company, uh, Wayne Cross. Uh, and like I say, the opportunities here. And we're getting old. Uh, for some reason, there's a big void in our industry. And we just can't figure it out sometimes. The pays are good. The opportunities are great. Uh, but we just don't see young students going into the mechanical engineering department with our contractors. So we're here to change that a little bit. Let everybody know what's going on. Get you excited on the national level to get involved in the programs. Well, Tony and I have a lot of work to do ahead of us, too, so we can get this program going in the right direction. The good news is we've got total cooperation with the engineering department from Robert Morris, and uh, the president of the university has uh, given a blessing to all this, so we're ready to roll. So I thought I'd bring a young, dynamic speaker in here tonight. He's from Denver, Colorado. Uh, he speaks at our Texas a and We have a uh, national, uh, for lack of words, academy where we send our current project managers and superintendents down to Texas A&M where they go to ongoing training. We send young guys down there when you do go to work for our company to get more educated in the engineering field. And uh, Nathan Wood's been speaking down there for several times. So uh, with that being said, Nathan, I'm not going to say too much more because I don't understand basically what you do. <laughs> it's all yours, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, before I talk a little bit about myself, and, and thanks a lot for that, Reach. Um, so is, is everybody here currently in mechanical engineering? Do we have any other non-mechanical non engineers? What other engineering do we have? Biomedical. 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 <laughs> and so what, what drew you to, to this topic or this uh, group? I'm curious for biomedical. Just we have a Wednesday yeah. evening class, and, and I gave them the option of coming here instead of listening to me lecture. Oh, so, you, so they get credit for it? <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Well, all right, try not to fall asleep. <laughs> um, so I guess my next question would be, how many folks have heard of BIM before, Building Information Modeling? Okay, a couple. Or, okay, show of hands. So is that, has anyone actually used any of the, the BIM programs before, any of the BIM software? Which, which ones have you used? Yeah, so Revit would be one by uh, Autodesk, the original makers of AutoCAD back in the 80s. Revit is, is definitely what most in, uh, architects and now engineers and even fabricators are now using to produce their models. It's a great authoring tool. Has anyone ever heard of Navisworks before? That's, so that's another one where if you're more the coordinator, you're the one trying to make sure that everything spatially fits together within a design. That we, we talk a lot about the difference between BIM authoring and BIM coordination. And as a mechanical contractor, or as, as anyone that's trying to enter the mechanical or any systems engineering field, understanding the difference between what's happening in the design phase, what are the constraints and limitations and opportunities, especially with technology in design, and how is that different from the very real world constraints of construction that rely on material science and gravity and all these other sciences, but we often look at it as like, oh, well that's just construction, right? How many folks kind of look down on the non-design side of, of engineering? 
I, I certainly did. I mean, I, I contemplated as a civil engineer at a University of Texas, should I go structural design engineering or should I go general contracting? Is anybody kind of toying with that decision or uh, have any, does everyone know exactly what they're going to do coming out of college? <laughs> Nobody? Anybody? All right, what do you, what do you want to do when you come out of college? Well, currently I'm a mechanical contractor, but I am planning to go into aerospace engineering in the Air Force as an officer. Wow. See, you get, you get your path, though. I like that. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions as we go through. So, um, so hopefully I, I can help a a answer or address any of those questions that, that may be looming. You know, if, uh, if there are no questions, I'll probably blow through this stuff in an hour and a half, two hours, so we can get out of here. But I, I don't think that'd be nearly as valuable as, as the conversation that we have. So definitely do raise your hand. Something comes up. Let's, let's have a discussion and go back and forth on it. Um, but with that, diving in, so the, the topic that we're going to talk about, and this is, again, what, uh, what I typically give for project managers that have been in the industry for five or ten years, um, a lot of the same topics apply. We'll just talk to them a little bit differently. Um, but the, the expectations going in, so we talk about, a lot about this term digital transformation. Has, has anyone ever heard that term before? Use that term? So it's, it really, okay, has anyone ever used Uber before? <laughs> What, what industry did Uber transform that maybe you used to use in that case otherwise? If, if you needed to get from A to B and you didn't have Uber, what would you have used? Taxi. Taxi, exactly. So as Uber has disrupted the taxi industry, a lot of this question is, what, what is that technology, what is that Uber that's going to disrupt or transform, depending on which end you're looking at it, the construction industry and the design industry and the manufacturing industry and a lot of these different, different aspects. Um, that, that we're seeing you know, across all industries, but um, uh, definitely a lot in construction right now, which is why it's a very exciting time to be in construction, because uh, typically we, the construction has lagged behind when it comes to innovation and digital, but really all that means is that because technology has come so far, there's just that much greater pressure uh, that we're gonna talk about later. But the, the whole idea of this pressure that you know in, in the 80s or 20 years ago, everything was a, a different piece of technology, a different tool, and now everything is essentially in your iPhone. And there is so much that we can do today just with the capabilities of technology. But as we all know, you know we, we're probably better with our phone, iPhones than our parents are, and it, it depends a lot on individuals' abilities. And when we're talking about organizations and project teams, really this technology, it, it's, it's only as good as the weakest link. So a lot of the challenge that we're talking about is how do we leverage all the great resources of uh, younger, more digitally savvy uh, employees in, or staff entering the workforce and how do we complement that with a lot of the uh, experience from those who've been in the industry for a long time but maybe aren't as adept with a lot of these uh, new digital tools. Um, but ultimately, has anyone seen the, a lot of productivity graphs in construction and that construction generally hasn't increased productivity in about 50 or 60 years? I mean, the, the studies and uh, if you look at McKinsey, uh, it's come out with a lot of reports about just the, the lack of productivity in this industry. And a lot of the root causes come down to not lack of technology, but just lack of organization, uh, lack of understanding of contract incentives. Um, we're going to talk. Has anyone taken that, uh, or understand anything about construction contracts? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. And, and that's something that, as you in the world, regardless of which side you go to, you better understand. I mean, one, one of the probably what should have been the most boring class in my civil engineering days was contracts, liability, and ethics in construction. Mm -hmm. But because I had gone through a couple internships and saw the real world and then went back and studied, I was like, this is fascinating. Because it's everything that is preventing all this technology we're going to talk about from working. So I, I need everybody here to bring up ideas to talk about, like, well, well, that's stupid. Why aren't you guys doing it that way? Because that's what this industry needs. Is, is a bunch of wise fools that are willing to ask these uncomfortable questions of, well, we usually, we'll probably have done it because that's just the way we've always done it. Uh, and the more you can understand why those go back to codes, go back to other you know, uh, engineering reasons why we do things. But a lot of them are not actually engineering reasons, they're just received traditions from past generations. And it's, it's great for the newer generations to really challenge a lot of those assumptions. Um, and the biggest thing in this industry that, that as you'll see in all these studies, it has a lot of problems. It, you'd be hard pressed to find someone in this industry that will admit that this industry has problems and kind of that, that pride thing is a little bit of a challenge that um, I think again, those who are new and excited to come in and, and not disrupt but transform, 
this industry to make it better through what you provide and, and want to learn from those um, who have a lot of experience in the room that hopefully I'll be calling on later uh, to provide some of that expertise. But um, the first section we're going to is uh, leveraging digital. And uh, another thing that we talk a lot about in, and we'll go deeper in, in other presentations, is this idea of the fourth industrial revolution. So the, the term digital transformation is one of them, or the digital age. Uh, this, this, another term is the fourth industrial revolution. And as you think about the, the first two industrial revolutions, but the, the steam power, uh, and then the one that we always typically think of, of the main industrial revolution of Henry Ford and the assembly line in the early 1900s, and how that really transgressed into the third industrial revolution, which is really the, the rise of early computers and early automation, things that in much more repeatable processes like manufacturing, uh, you were able to see a lot more efficiency. And has anyone in any of your classes studied Toyota and how their process was different than GM and a lot of other car companies? You have? Okay. Nobody else? Uh, so I'll go into it a little bit. So what was fundamentally different in the way that Toyota thought about the, the way that you design, the way that you produce, and the way that you manage quality and manage uh, standards is that there has to be a balance between top-down and bottom-up. And you have to have a certain level of standards that every car is going to go through. Every car has four tires, has a frame, has, you know, has certain minimum things, but then there's all these options that if we could do a better job of creating these kit of parts that you have different people responsible for different levels, and as long as they're filling those spots in, everybody's good. But it's, it's a much more democratic way of managing people, managing process, and managing standards. It, it's a much more disruptive way of thinking. And actually, it, it took almost 25 years from when Toyota first came to the US to teach GM this idea of lean manufacturing. Has anyone heard the term lean before? OK, a couple of hands. So lean is essentially in, invented or, or uh, really mass produced by a lot of the efforts that Toyota and Taichi Ono did. It has to do with this Toyota production system. And, and really, construction has been chasing this ever since. I'm trying to say, what is that version of that in design and construction when obviously we're not making the same car over and over and over again. Every design is different, but there are a lot of these philosophies that we can follow. Um, but, but again, this is stuff that goes back to the 60s. So as, as we start to understand that, well, yeah, that stuff works really well in very repeatable, very you know, uh, fabrication work or in the manufacturing shops, but how much of the work for a mechanical contractor or, uh, or any, any level of design that is now looking at prefabrication, where we now want to make a lot of these decisions much earlier because we know exactly what the conditions are going to be in the field, we have to totally shift our mindset on how much of the work that we do in, in our daily jobs, how much of the work that we design. So regardless if you're going to be a contractor or a designer, how are you designing for manufacturing and assembly. That's actually a new acronym now called DFMA, Design for Manufacturing and Assembly. Um, and, and these are all things that, again, have been boiling up and have been getting better in these other industries. And construction has been very resistant to it for a lot of reasons, valid and, and not valid. But we're, we're hitting this, this sort of tipping point of social media and the ubiquity of iPhones and this idea of reimagining the way that we work. Has anyone heard of the idea of, um, of, of an open office environment, sort of all the desks being lower, kind of the new Google style um, free, free workplace? And so there's a great video, there's this full nine minutes, I'm just going to play a section of it, where he talks about uh, really this fundamental paradigm shift that's required to reimagine When work. you use something like Facebook or Twitter, it doesn't have to be those platforms, you are using a fundamentally different culture of collaboration. You are saying pretty much, by default, everything I do is open, except for the bits that I choose to keep private. Contrast that to the standard, the culture of collaboration inside most organizations. It's completely inverted. Everything I do is closed unless I specifically say I'm going to share this. The change in that is absolutely profound. When you have people who are used to that sharing experience, that rich, friction-free way of sharing information, collaborating with their friends and family, and they join organizations and they cannot share in that way, trouble starts to happen. It also makes us realize how some of the way we live our, our working lives today has, 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 has sort of become outdated. It's become out of place for the kind of society that we live in. We're in a world now where productivity, the thing that we've been chasing for hundreds of years, is fast becoming the problem. So what are maybe some examples in the uh, academic world 
where traditional mindsets of what should be private, what should be open, it, or, or social media in general. Um, can you think of any examples of where we're sort of hitting this, this cultural barrier that technology is creating for us? I mean, shoot, just social media in general. Media in general. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hashtag fake news. <laughs> like, it's, it's everywhere, you know, it's, you, you can name anything, and it's, it's affecting everywhere. So, um, so, so that, that has a lot to do with this pressure that we're feeling uh, in construction and, and in the design aspects of it as well, really all professional services. Uh, and, and there's this really great report that uh, Deloitte put out, University Press, talking about this disruption pressure that's coming from technology and uh, this idea that, that because technology is changing in an exponential path, if you, if you study Moore's Law or any, any of the studies that, that show that exponential path of technology's ability to change, whereas you know, typically mo most folks are happy with a, a linear business productivity change and that's what's been the norm forever, although in our industry it's actually been flat because uh, again, construction productivity has been flat, so we again have that much greater pressure but it's not, it's not just the technology that's creating that pressure. That's just one aspect of it. It's just the iPhone that is that, that tipping point where you need the individual that feels comfortable sharing their location, putting their credit card on, on the phone, on Uber's app, and then getting in the back seat with a random stranger to make that business model work. And so we forget that there's all these other tipping points. And so in design and in codes like public policy, and other standards, you know, a, a lot of those are the final tipping point that has made it very hard for this industry to innovate, to progress, because there are just so many pressures both from the business side and from the public policy side uh, that are adding to that pressure on the individual that may or may not want to adopt the technology in the first place. Yeah? When you say that construction is flatter, are you saying that the, the production rate, so the, the rate at which you build a building or something along those lines is pretty much the same? It's, yeah, it's, it's a study that was put out by a Stanford professor, and they actually, there's, it gets really nerdy on how they measure the productivity, but it's essentially number of man hours spent over, uh, over more dollars installed, um, and, and it's, it's factored for um, you know, inflation and everything. And so the graph that we'll, we'll actually come back to it again in a second here uh, is, is research that's showing that time over time, Manufacturing, uh, other industries other than uh, basically farming, uh, which can't uh, <laughs> produce any faster, and construction are are stagnant. And uh, so, so, yeah, we'll, and that's really again what's adding that pressure. So we'll we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, the uh, oh, actually, let's get past that part real quick. Uh, because really, what what's important here is uh, understanding that again, even with. Uh, the, the best uh, public policy, even with the best business incentives, there's still kind of that individual, some folks like technology, some don't, and generally in construction, you don't think of it as the most uh, tech savvy and, and wanting to uh, adopt technology. And in fact, we, we still see in, in the industry folks that are, are so proud of their paper uh, on the far right side that, it, and again, it's very great organization, great great pride in their work, but is, is a dying industry. You know? I think anyone that wants to get out of school and do that, uh, probably isn't going to make it very long, but it's, it is amazing to see how many more of these manufacturing fabrication shops, uh, this is a mechanical yard, or a mechanical fabrication shop in Houston, their plumbing shop was, had gone completely paperless, they're completely creating uh, 3D isometric spools that come out of Revit, uh, uh, in the authoring tool, and they're trying to fully integrate the supply chain from design through fabrication, through delivery, through installation, through QAQC. And, you know, again, there, there's so much opportunity for that, but where, where do you feel like we would run into issues with uh, exchanging that information? For those who have looked at, you know, design, collaboration, have you guys ever done any classes where you are, are now exchanging with other departments, other folks uh, between design files? Not yet? Okay. Probably um, not senior year. Probably not, yeah, probably not until senior year. Because that's really where it starts to get interesting is when it's not just your design, it's our design. And a lot of times the quality of the design is only as good as the ability for everybody to talk to one another. And when some like technology and some don't, it, it only adds to those wires getting crossed and, and the challenge that we've had with adopting technology in the construction industry. Um, and, and also what we've forgotten is that you know so much of this like 
global warming or recycling or anything. We know we should do it and that it's the thing we should do, but at the end of the day, what's really going to motivate you to take that next step to, uh, to change your habits and to get, um, go through this sort of digital transformation? And this graphic that we often show of the pyramid of um, with them, what's in it for me, is, is an acronym we throw around a lot because so much of uh, business and, and traditional industry says, well, well, yeah, you should do this because that's the way that I designed this and as long as you fit in my box, we'll be efficient. But Uber and the digital age and, and bottom-up disruption say, well, well, no, until we agree that it's best for us, it's not going to be more efficient, it's not going to really take off, it's not going to go through that exponential change. And so we have to balance from the very top, starting with AHJs, the authorities having jurisdiction, those permitting agencies and the governments that control that information uh, that don't really care about efficiency and, except for maybe the personal efficiency if you're an inspector, but they care more that it's reliable and that you know, they're, they're keeping their job and that it's fail safe. If you're a project executive, you, you probably are really excited about all these fancy new dashboards with all this data that tells you how much money you're making or losing and, and where things are happening. However, again, uh, th th that only happens when we get down to the data producers, those who are actually creating that information and what's their incentive to put that information in. What's their incentive to, to turn on that our location, let Uber track me and let, let it pay through that system. If we don't trust that system, if we don't trust Uber, if we don't trust our company, and the technology systems that we work in or our projects, then we're probably not going to adopt that and this whole pyramid falls apart. Um, so again, very much a, a, a weakest link challenge that we're dealing with in this industry, but a huge opportunity for us um, to, when we do fit all those pieces together. All right, um, so here, here we'll get into the, yeah, the tipping points just that you were talking about earlier. in mind was, you know, this kind of change is so sort of revolutionary to some people, and to use Breach's term, the old timers, I would imagine, would have a hard time with this, and um, so I'm imagining that there's probably a lot of issues with training, right? Trying to get people on the same level. Well, and even what what is training anymore? When uh, you know apps are so easy, like it, the, the technology, you shouldn't need to train on the technology anymore. You should be more educating on the process and the higher level. So I think even the way that we train in the future needs to start to ch uh, change and evolve and. And having these conversations at the university level is a huge part of that as well. You know, it's amazing to see how many more of these types of programs, not just driven from uh, NCA type members, but driven from technology partners, software guys, saying we know that we need to get into these universities because if the students are using the tools now to collaborate, how are they ever going to feel comfortable out in the real world doing it? And so, what we should get to at the end of the day is. It doesn't matter if it's Revit or if it's uh, a Bentley system. Or, you know, there's probably five or six different ones that could do the same thing. And if if we're all on the same universal standard, uh, then it wouldn't matter. You choose the tool that works best for you at, at the bottom of that pyramid, and you're still meeting whatever that city or that jurisdiction or that government says is their requirement for what you're handing over to them as a design or as a final deliver one. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's very much, uh, they, they talk about this idea of wicked problems where there are multiple variables hitting it from all different sides. And, and part of what we're gonna be doing today is trying to break apart what are those different variables, which ones are barriers, which ones are roadblocks, but I'm already getting ahead of myself again. So um, let me really quickly go through this, which is, uh, I, I mentioned before all these McKinsey reports, and I highly recommend looking them up and at least skimming through some of the data and some of the documents. It's, it's uh, slightly embarrassing if you're from the industry because it doesn't make construction look the best. In fact, uh, I think on this one here, construction's down at the very bottom down there uh, when it comes to uh, essentially use of uh, big data and, and how digital they are compared to all the Airbnb or Uber type disrupted industries like transportation or hospitality, a lot of those um, that fit over there. So um, the, uh, the, the ways that you can improve it, which uh, I'm curious here, uh, we talked earlier about rethinking the design and engineering processes because uh, there, I, we got sort of some not sure hands on, you know, do, do we want to go uh, design engineering side or do you want to go sort of mechanical contractor side? Uh, I'm curious, has, has anyone done any internships yet out in the real world and experience on either design? So what, what, what was your experience? I was actually with Michael Baker on the design side. On the design side. So did, what was your interaction with the construction side as, as on the design side? Uh, personally, as, as an intern, not too much. Not too much. 
Uh, but I guess, because uh, what, what I've found, or, and maybe even just, cause are you a junior now, or what? what I'm actually you? a fifth year master. Oh, yeah. awesome, okay, great. Um, but in, in your time at Baker Hughes, it was, I would assume that in the design, the engineering to fabrication process, there is some level of an information handover that has to go to them, and I think the fact that you weren't aware of it is, is probably pretty telling to where the industry's at. Usually it's fairly siloed, and everybody's just dumping things over the fence. It's like, oh yeah, who cares about those guys? That's the other team. It's like, well, you do realize we're all building the same project, right? But contractually, we might not always be on the same team. And so a lot of times, uh, so many of these things that we should be doing to improve procurement and supply chain management, to uh, infuse digital technology, new materials, and advanced automation, there's not always an incentive in this industry to do that. Um, now, as a mechanical contractor, I would argue that you probably could, uh, could do all of those on your own regardless of outside impacts and outside forces uh, because of the way that they're very strategically positioned. But that's uh, a, a, deeper, a deeper topic that we're probably gonna go to tonight, so I'll just keep going. Um, here, here's the graphic of the productivity we were talking about earlier. And uh, for those who, who are not familiar, this is a, um, or they actually refer to this as the, the Teichholz graph now. Paul Teichholz was a Stanford professor, head of the Center for Integrated Facilities Engineering, SIFE. And uh, this was uh, about, I think, 10 years or so of research to uh, develop this graphic of uh, not construction versus non-farm productivity labor from 1964 until, I think it was about 2004 when they produced this. And so you can see here again that negative, uh, the, the decline ever since 1964. And what's uh, coincidental, I learned this in doing some, some research myself, that the Empire State Building in New York was actually the fastest uh, erected building in the US t history today. Did anyone know that? Um, so has anyone taken any scheduling classes by chance? Or learn about scheduling software. So there's two different types of scheduling software, scheduling philosophies, methodologies. There's a critical path method, and then there's what called uh, location-based or line of balance. And this was done back before the critical path method, which is a much more litigious, uh, much more um, contractual way of managing schedules became the norm in about the 1950s. And then between that and of course safety concerns and other things, there's a ton of reasons why you know, it was really not a safe job. Yes, Thomas. Construction activities that red line based upon. Mm -hmm. well, so it's based on essentially manpower per per, uh, um, per yeah. So con uh, constant number of contracts per work hours of hourly workers. So it's essentially the uh, dollars of um, dollars of work in place per man hour worker. And that's set to inflation. Is how that's set. Well, the wage rate have anything to do with it? Uh, no, because it's it's not the dollar of the wage; it's the dollar of well, the, the dollar, material. Is the dollar, the dollar uh, counted for inflation, or you know, there's something fishy here. I mean, when you're welding back in 1940, you're welding today. You can weld much faster. Welding, yes. I'm talking about complete, yeah, complete construction. So soup to nuts of any project. So not not a mechanical uh, contractor's productivity, but a project's productivity. Well, even even concrete plates. You know, the tools today with uh, building the surface application app machines. But then, what happens when a mistake happens? Well, I'll show sure you concrete for today. They're just absolutely amazing. And, Done by machines and very few people. So I, I, I wonder how that data come up. But it's fine. So. Yeah, no, we, we can have a sidebar, but believe me, this is, uh, I, it, I mean, people were showing this to me eight years ago, and this is almost every single conference you go to, this is certainly not disputed evidence by any means. 40 years, I, I, yeah. I saw the productivity increase. Like, increase, increase. Yeah, and, and again, I, and, and it's the difference between individual improvements versus a project as a whole. And so what we're talking about are things like codes, things like safety, things like uh, delays that are, are due to things that we should have done. And I'm not saying it's yeah, construction bad. Yeah, exactly, and that's the point, yeah. That's the point. A ton of people died for them to build it that fast. So I'm not saying we should go back to that way, but it's very interesting to know what are all those different factors that are impacting why we are not more productive, because we're not. Does, does this take into account complexity of building? 
right? I mean, you exactly. No, it's, it's so much more complex. Mechanical systems, yeah. a lot more. That was so repeatable uh, right there. Yeah. You know, other than those couple inlets, it was a very, very simple, very, very modular design. That is another reason why it's it's that much more productive. And so, so yeah. building of similar size nowadays might take twice as many man hours as it did back then. Even though the productivity is better, you have a whole bunch more design and architecture and engineering yeah. and, and all of these other aspects that maybe sensors and you know all kinds of things that would never be in that building. Yeah, I mean, the Golden Gate Bridge was built in 19, I think 35, and it was somewhere between seven and 10 years, I believe. This most recent Bay Bridge, which really began design ever since the 89 earthquake, took almost 25 years to complete, was 14 years uh, over schedule, or I'm sorry, yeah, seven years over schedule and $14 billion over budget. So I mean, that, that's why that hasn't gone up. It's not that we haven't figured out more efficient ways to build, it's that it's got more complex, we have more variables of safety, uh, and, and ultimately there hasn't been that much incentive to increase that productivity because we're still making the same margins off the waste uh, as we are off increased productivity. At least as a general contractor, I always have to, I always have to clarify that um, I did spend my time with a general contractor, not a general <laughs> contractor. Um, I, I, I think mechanical contractors have a, a way better uh, future ahead of them. We, you going back to that Uber example, if you think about in a construction project, uh, or, or we'll, use, we'll start with taxis, uh, when, Uber's, when Uber disrupts the taxi companies, the drivers don't necessarily lose their jobs. They just get to go over and be Uber drivers and everything's fine. Who loses their job is the taxi manager that gets completely disrupted. And so you look at this industry and you look at what is that Uber for construction, it's not going to disrupt the mechanical contractor. It's going to disrupt the general contractor. But it's because the mechanical contractor recognizes that it's better to be an Uber driver than it is to be a taxi driver. And that's, again, that paradigm shift of rethinking strategy, rethinking competition. Because um, that's exactly what Toyota did in the 80s when they came over. Uh, there was a great uh, podcast that NPR put out, This American Life, where they talk about uh, in 1984 when Toyota came to uh, Fremont, California to teach GM how to, build, uh, how to build faster, cheaper, smaller, higher quality cars in exchange for learning how to build in America and get through a lot of these tax rules. Other things, it was kind of like, wait, why were these two biggest com car companies be collaborating and sharing all this knowledge, there actually was a reason why, but GM certainly got the raw end of the deal, and, and Toyota obviously now is the largest car company in the world, and a lot of that had to do with the way that they thought about uh, uh, the design and the manufacturing, and again, that, that bottom-up idea, whereas again, construction sort of followed uh, a lot of the same traditional kind of waterfall path, and so it's interesting to look at today, if you go back to that same plant where Toyota had come 25, 30 years ago, it's now actually the current Tesla plant, where you hardly see any folks on site, and it's almost completely robotic, and that truly is that next level of disruption that, I mean, that, that scares me, but certainly we, we've got a long, long time in this industry before we're, we're at that level, and, uh, but it's, it's crazy to see that it's, it is uh, getting a lot closer. So what, what all this kind of gets around to, what it hits on, I know it's uh, not, not the easiest topic to discuss, but there's a great book that hits on this innovator's dilemma, this idea of disruptive technology that is everywhere. Um, and, and a great example is, is sort of the disruption of the cell phone. And as cell phone became so ubiquitous and you know, they kind of replaced the walkie-talkie, but on the field, on the job site, you had to have that Nextel two-way push to talk because, I mean, that was, that was gold. But now you go to any, MCA event, you go to any conference and ask, how many superintendents out there still have one of these Nextel phones? Nobody does. They, they all have iPhones because they've got everything that that had and then some, and it's sort of become that new norm. It's past that tipping point. And so the question is, with things like BIM, that's been around solidly for a good 10 years, just as the iPhone has, but you don't see every job using BIM the same way you see every job with an iPhone. And so what, why is that? Any guesses? Okay, a lot of it's that same sort of it's weakest link. Large. Yeah, well, well, and, and it's the whole weakest link. You know, it's an, an iPhone is just as good as the individual getting their own efficiency. And you know, we, everybody has iPhones. Doesn't mean they're necessarily effective with them, but they have. Them. And so, BIM, I think, is the same way. It may be out there, and maybe more projects are even doing it than we know. We're just not asking the right questions. We're just not sharing that information as an industry. And that's where, again, the more as you get into hopefully senior design groups and we can look at ways to collaborate with uh, other uh, engineering schools. And, um, and is, there, is there an architecture school here as well or is it just engineering? Just engineering. Just engineering, okay. 
It's okay, I'm gonna like our chicks now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you had a point there. Yeah. A lot of our contractors keep that to themselves. And, and they consider it an expense to go to the new technology. They, they feel they're ahead of the competition by keeping BIM or upgraded technical systems to themselves rather than, you know, I got this and this guy don't. We're not going to teach this, you know. I mean, those who are. But it's an expense yeah. to the contractor to have them trained too. And really, the, the tipping point that we're seeing are the, the, the mid sized contractors that are realizing. Oh crap! I thought I didn't have to do this stuff, and now I'm hearing from my, all my owners and everybody else that I do need to do this stuff. And when we're really seeing that pickup, which is a great opportunity if, if, you know, for those coming out of school that have some of this basic understanding of it, because there's going to be a huge need for BIM roles in general, you know, across all sides. I, I think I, someone told me a stat that LinkedIn adds thirty thousand roles with the title BIM in it every month uh, globally. I mean, most of them are in India, but. Um, but it's, it is really amazing, uh, you know, how much uh, it's, it's taking off. But uh, so, so BIM, but really BIM is just one of many technologies. So we'll, we'll actually dive into the, the construction technology side now, which hopefully will get a little bit more fun. So this graphic right here that comes from the World Economic Forum um, breaks down, again, across des uh, design engineering, construction, and operations along the top. Uh, and then uh, you can see on the left side here, user interfaces and applications software platform and control, and then digital physical integration layer. So these are all different tools uh, that essentially have abilities to talk to each other to create this utopian supply chain that everybody talks to each other and we never have mistakes in design and construction world. Um, you know, we're, we're, not, we're certainly not there yet, but uh, it's really interesting to see the, the different examples of where this is happening. So I'm curious, has anyone uh, played around with or, or seen stuff related to drones and like how, like how would drones be used in construction or in mechanical contractor? A lot of it has to do with like part like surveying. Um, I've looked into it more on the military side, what we use them for and how we build them. Mm -hmm. I can definitely imagine it for surveying, safety reasons, even communication, and just a better idea of what's going on. Exactly. And so here's the again, again, this is a, a general contractor, but yourself and others, even on the mechanical contractor side, are uh, continuing to see the, the benefits and the return on investment of at the phase where you're seeing a lot of construction movement. So let's say you were in uh, a heavy industrial, you're doing a, a, lot, a very long run of pipe and you want to have more automated productivity tracking of how much work did you get done each day, each week, each whatever. And a lot of times these things are manually counted or, or, or not counted at all, they're just kind of ballparked. And it's becoming so much uh, easier and less expensive now to just you know buy a lot of these off-the-shelf drones that you can set the, the GPS points of where they go, they're taking photos, they're able to take a mesh of photos and actually create a whole 3D map. Uh, and, and then if you're doing it day over day or week over week, now you've got periodic changes where you can actually go back in time and see when did things change. We've had times before where folks, folks tried to steal uh, um, equipment off or like dirt off the site and you could go back in the drone photos and find out who took it and where they took it to and go back and charge them for it. Um, <clears throat> So the drone's a huge one, yeah. You, you would be able, to, I, I'm assuming less man hours on the site, right? If you had this. Yeah, sort of exactly. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, yeah. The, the, the safest anyone can be is not on the job site. And so, yeah, the more that you're doing this stuff with technology, the better off uh, you're going to be, both from a manpower and a safety standpoint. Absolutely. Um, so, another one along the bottom here is uh, embedded sensors. So that's, that's a, a big one that it has a lot of potential, but a lot of, uh, I don't know, I guess I'll say fear. I'm, I'm curious as you watch the, uh, some of these ideas of tracking not just safety, but also potentially productivity at the individual worker level. Now there's a lot of opportunities for that, but what's, what's the dark side of that, Reed? Guys will leave go to another company. <laughs> well, why, why would he leave and go to another company? Because he's lacking for it. Uh, well, no, or, but no, but or would he figure out a way to take it off and not, you know, would he resist being tracked at that level? Yeah. I mean, does any does anybody want to be tracked at, at that level of? 
mean, I guess it depends on what they're looking at, right? I mean, Uber tracks everywhere I go in the car. I don't seem to care because I don't really do anything with it. It's just like freight companies tracking track and trade. The same, same philosophy. Same idea. But once yeah. it's on a person, yeah. all of a sudden, it's, it becomes a lot bigger deal. Yeah, and we forget that sometimes when we're just looking at productivity. We're like, oh, we're just trying to solve the problem. You, we forget the human impact of are we actually going to track this person? And if so, what are we going to track? And how is that going to change the way that they behave? You know, t tell me how I measure, and I'll tell you how I behave. We'll is it a great next Toyota? Toyota. Yeah, <laughs> but but th this is that's really a lot. Again, a lot of the more cultural disruption that is needed to unlock the potential of these these bottom up tools. And as we move our way up, we, we uh, look at BIM and different ways of, of integrating information. Again, because now all this information can be in the cloud, it's essentially your your shared Google spreadsheet, but for every piece of information in the project. And so if anyone's had a really big spreadsheet with a bunch of people invited, you probably have some errors and some overlaps and some rewrites and some, oh, what are you doing? You didn't follow the rules right. And it's that, but you know, times 3D. So a lot, a lot of challenges in there, but some really cool things that, uh, that coming out of that are possible. So I'm going to show this one here of virtual reality. So is, is anyone uh, familiar with the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality? Does anyone describe what, what an example of virtual reality? No. It's like no. you're in a 3D space and yeah. you move around in the 3D space. Or even like the tool, like the, what's the headset? It's like uh, Oculus, right? Yeah, Oculus is one Oculus of them. Or, or, yeah. um, so like th this would be a great example of virtual reality where, again, you're completely immersing yourself in the space. So if you're a designer that is uh, fairly new to construction and uh, usually what you do is you do a lot of site walks and that's how you learn about the engineering. But it's an extremely unsafe thing to do. And as cool as it is, uh, to go out and do those site walks, a lot of these can be just as well conveyed through 3D models of what the design is going to be and a much more immersive way of kind of looking around through virtual reality. And again, these, these are becoming increasingly less expensive and more portable and more cloud-based so that you know you can be uh, on a job site and say, hey, we got this issue over here, send it to that engineer. And the engineer likes VR and happens to feel comfortable in it. They can go in there and, and see it, uh, an answer any questions to it, and then send that information back. So re really cool where the potential is going with stuff like virtual reality. So you mentioned augmented, because that's where you actually use physical real life space. Yeah, and let's go to that one next. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so augmented reality, is, AR is like the, the Microsoft HoloLens, if you've heard of that, or originally Google Glass, but actually technically wasn't augmented reality, because it wasn't in front of your face, you had to you know, look cross-eyed. So this is a great example of, um, there's actually a drywall uh, trade contractor, Cody Knox in South uh, or, or Southern California. And they do a lot of work because they do a lot of high-end, the, uh, the Disney concert hall, if you've ever seen you know, the crazy um, Frank Gehry design, they, they help build that. And so he has this uh, BIM cave office in the office that you'll see here in a second, where they have set up this whole environment for building a prefabricated bathroom pod. That, and, and the whole question is, can you get to the point where we don't even need 2D drawings in order to build this anymore? Um, and I'll, I'll skip ahead a little bit to actually get to the demo of it. But uh, here it is. So this is, this is an actual carpenter foreman who uh, would, would typically be building off of a 2D set of drawings that is now wearing this HoloLens. Again, he's in a controlled space. He's not out on a job site, so he doesn't need to wear a hard hat. Um, but he is using the information directly from those lines that he's seeing uh, coming out right in front of his face from that HoloLens to build from. So, I mean, you, you talk about efficiency, you talk about quality, uh, you talk about reliability, but, but really reliability, that same weakest link thing. You know, and, and I asked that question, I was able to actually go here and try the same HoloLens on and, and do this whole experience. And, and man, I was like shaking my head around trying to get it to, to lose its point because I know that what's most important is if you ever get into the field, what is most important is layout, layout, layout. You know, what is your uh, your X Y Z coordinate point, and how far are you pulling from that known uh, control point to get to there? And this very much challenges that notion. And you're going to get a lot of pushback from anybody in construction that says, "No, no, 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 that's never going to work. It's never going to work. You got to do it off of this line." But I'm telling you, there are probably four or five different layers of technology through laser scanning, through uh, the inertia measurement units, <coughs> through uh, visual scanning, and then through uh, total, total robotic total station point integration that's making this work. Yeah. So did it work as well as making it look like on the video? 
It, it actually, it, again, within this proof of concept, it does. And as more things are getting moved off site, you're going to see just that much more of this. And in an even more recent example, uh, he actually pulled up a 2D, sheet, like a PDF drawing in augmented reality, which is actually really cool because more often than not as a mechanical, you're probably going to be looking at the school sheet and saying, where is that school sheet going? And so if you've got school sheet information, oops, um, and then, uh, and, and yeah, if you've got that school sheet information and it's being transferred over, you know, you got best of both worlds. So, all right, that was, um, that was a good example there. The, uh, the last one at the top is, is just the idea of big data analytics. And um, again, this is more for the business executives, for those who are seeing the 50,000 foot view and say, I wanna see all these dashboards and pie charts and, um, and information about my projects and how it's doing. And uh, I'll, I'll play this for you because it's a funny video. Um, I, hopefully it will make sense as to a lot of what I've been alluding to as to uh, the term garbage in, garbage out. Uh, so with that, I'll just play this. Peter, come take a look at this. This is The numbers, they keep getting bigger and bigger. The clicks are off the charts. Yeah. Yoshi, it's Walter. We're back. Get there! I What the? sensors, you know, what is the incentive for that guy to want to track information that's going to make its way up to give really good actual insights. And, and again, I, I'm, I'm not denying that individual processes have become more productive, but a lot of lean, a lot of the waste is overproduction. And so it's the fact that we're too productive and we're not stopping and thinking enough to make sure we're producing the right amount uh, that can often lead to situations like that. All right, um, so moving into the, the hype of technology, because uh, I mentioned before, it's an amazing time to be in construction. I mean, there are so many startups and venture capital funding, $490 million uh, being invested into software to essentially disrupt or transform this industry. And they, they come across architecture, engineering, operations, maintenance, uh, all kinds of scanning technology, so it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's amazing how much is out there. And even a lot of folks are, are honestly, uh, for better or for worse, leaving the construction industry to go work for these technology companies because they've got all this venture capital money to spend and they'll pay the salaries to the top talent and say, we need to know what's going on in this industry because what we've got is a bunch of really smart tech people but we don't have anybody that understands construction and can speak tech. So if you can be that, that's, that's a gold mine to, to be able to speak the technology and understand enough about what it's doing, where it's at, how it's impacting this industry, but to also be someone that is from this industry, that is an engineer, that is a mechanical contractor, um, because it, it adds that much more credibility in, in sort of that side of the world. Um, but ultimately, all these different technologies, all these apps, Uber included, go through what, what Gartner calls the, P, or the uh, Gartner hype curve. So it uh, starts to see with a technology trigger, um, goes through a peak of inflated expectations, so that the, the high Google Glass view, perfect example of augmented reality, peak of inflated expectations, and then its downfall, falling into that trough of disillusionment. But then as you see things like Microsoft HoloLens coming out going, oh man, augmented reality might actually make, make something where it can, it just sort of fits into everyday life, like your iPhone, that absolutely has hit that plateau of productivity. So we talked earlier about like, where, where does BIM fit? and all of that. And, and for those who are not as familiar with BIM, the definition from the National BIM Stand in 2007 says, BIM is a shared knowledge resource for information about a facility forming a reliable basis for decisions during its life cycle. So it, it's basically your, your Google Maps for your project, but Google didn't make it. 
and or it's, it's, no, it's, it's Apple Maps for, for your project. If anyone's ever used Apple Maps and gotten in the wrong place before, you go, I will never use that thing again. Mm -hmm. Those who have bad experiences with BIM, you know, it's, it's a lot of the same analogies. But great, great tool. It is the, the foundation to which uh, we can really transform design and construction. Um, and it also takes the, the appropriate incentive. So uh, we, we talked, or maybe, maybe didn't talk earlier. Uh, my experience uh, with the general contractor was on an integrated project delivery contract. So I know most folks aren't too familiar with contracts, but you've got a traditional hard bid, uh, very closed door, very you know uh, defensive adversarial relationships. You've got kind of this middle ground design build where we're starting to talk between architects and contractors uh, with with uh, some flexibility, and then integrated project delivery is this ability to see this was uh, 10, 11 different parties, including the mechanical contractor, mechanical engineer, electrical plumbing, GC owner, all on the same contract, uh, trying to build this 320 million dollar hospital. 30% faster than any project had ever done it, ever, um, in California. And, and a lot of that because of um, public policy, because of state mandates for critical care facilities that say, until you meet these certain structural requirements, we're not gonna let you, you, know, you have to survive an earthquake. Hospital's the one thing that has to survive. And so it's very much that dilemma of reliability and us trying to gain efficiency through this more integrated contract. And, and definitely, this was, again, 2000, a 2009, right as BIM was hitting kind of that peak of inflated expectations, the possibility was there, and we really did create that possibility in that petri dish. But it was it was almost a false reality because everybody took the the uh, reports and the ENR magazines and said, oh yeah, every job can do that. Just just do BIM, and it really it wasn't that. And we'll talk about what ha what happened in it because my specific role on the job as a BIM engineer. So again, I, I came out of civil engineering. Uh, I knew a little bit about CAD and BIM, but not really. I had just kind of dove into it and uh, got my hands dirty with uh, a tool called Tecla Structures. And what we were able to do is we were able to take the fabrication drawings from the exterior skin contractors that they had a, a fairly uh, regimented uh, process, just like a mechanical would as well, for how they go through their uh, design and fabrication process. But usually how well that's organized with the engineer itself or with the architect happens less often. And so what we were doing is comparing between the designer's drawings and our drawings. So essentially this was all of the 2D fabrication drawings that were coming from three or four different uh, trade, con trade fabricators. And we were meshing all that other thing together and kind of paint by numbers and create a bit of, okay, that's actually what we're gonna build because that's what the drawings say we're gonna build. And then we're going to compare that to what we actually designed and see if that actually matches because everybody else, mechanical and everybody else is assuming that what the architect is putting into their combined BIM, that Navisworks model, is going to be what's actually in the field. But the reality was it wasn't. We were finding small communication issues where uh, I think on oops, uh, this one here, the uh, window had been placed two foot six out. And I asked the one detailer, you know, what had happened. He goes, oh, you didn't get the email six months ago that I sent? And, and that's, that's how things happen. You know, it, we, it's little things like that. But, you know, th that could have been easily a $50,000 mistake just because someone didn't see an email. And, and so it's, it's so worth it to find these little issues of just backtracking back and, and the power of BIM to uh, identify a lot of these issues that typically happen way later in design. Another thing that happens all the time is, is waterproofing. If, if you ever uh, decide to, and I wouldn't recommend it, go to the general contracting side, you will deal a ton with waterproofing details. Um, and, and they're not fun. But the more we can leverage 3D technology, the more we can have better certainty of what people are going to fabricate so that we can actually come together and uh, you'll see here, we, we've had to fully design this very complex uh, situation here where typically you would never trust 3D information to build off of. It's, it's really more of just a for reference only and we, we do everything from these 2D uh, official drawings that we do. But in this case, we had completely changed our mindset and said, you know what, we trust this 3D information more than we trust our own 2D information after going through this exercise. So you, you tell us, Mr. General Contractor, what distance that should be in our, in our drawings because we don't know. You, you understand this system better than we do, so you tell us, and this may not sound review, but when you get into the industry and you understand the back and forth of design decisions and liability, that, that's a very weird thing to do in this industry, but things like integrated project delivery allowed us to do those sorts of things and create these efficiencies. 
so that we could prefabricate that panel, have it come out exactly to that size that it needed to be, and get that nice finished condition without any delays, without any waterproofing, without any rework, um, without any added cost to the owner. Um, but the reality, um, so mo moving up into the, the plateau of productivity, so this is where, um, again, we are absolutely increasing productivity. And here is mechanical with, uh, I think, 20% increase in productivity. Plumbing was 5% increase. Electrical was 5% increase. And drywall was 28% increase in productivity. And again, the reason why is not necessarily because each one of them was efficient on their own. In fact, plumbing was the only one that did not anticipate any increased productivity because they're already fully BIM enabled. They already have a, a, a supply chain on their own without anybody's help that they manage. They go, well, we don't need you guys. We're not going to be any more efficient. But even with the, the others that were more efficient, they ended up increasing by about 3%. It was the electrical that was like, oh, yeah, this BIM's going to be great. We're going to get a, you know, 10, 15% productivity increase. They only got five because they were a little bit earlier in this. They were still at that peak of inflated expectations. And in fact, the electrical didn't uh, get awarded the next job. It went to a different electrical, but both the mechanical and the plumbing and the drywall continued on the next job. So again, this is where really the, the rubber meets the road of, if you can't perform on these jobs, you don't get awarded the next job. It's not do you come in low cost, it's do you come in best performance. And that again is a huge paradigm shift in this industry that it, it, hopefully more of us are coming out expecting that, uh, but also knowing that, that that isn't the norm, that hasn't been. Was this the job that you worked? Were you able to figure out what the issue was? Or? Oh yeah, no, it, it absolutely was uh, inflated expectations and, and lack of skill uh, by the electrical to oh. do what they needed to do. So, so looking at the, um, so looking at the one up above, this, um, the upper one where we talk about rework. So the first question I usually ask to those in the industry is how many of your companies actually track rework? And usually you don't get any hands because why would you want to track your mistakes? But it's like saying you want to lose weight and you never weigh yourself. Like you know, again, if you don't measure it, you can't improve it. And, and so they did that on this on that on that job. And the electrical was a great example of one that again estimated like the other guys. That, yeah, we have about ten percent rework on jobs, which is you know, it's just the same ballpark everybody gives. But they were only able to have five percent rework savings instead of the others that were or sorry fifty percent savings as opposed to the others that were more like ninety to ninety five percent savings. And the reason why is because. The electrical, uh, they, they did not model to the same level of detail. And when you think about electrical systems, it's, it's spaghetti. And so it doesn't always make sense to model uh, conduit less than one inch in diameter. And they, they chose not to. And I don't necessarily say that modeling to uh, less than an inch will solve that rework problem. What I think their problem was is they didn't rethink the way they need to build. If they had just waited with all that conduit until after everybody else was in, and they were working around it, they can move their stuff really easily, but they were getting into areas and essentially building where they shouldn't have, and then when the other guys come through, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna blow through them, and then we end up with rework, and that's how they tracked it. But, um, so it's, it's, you know, rework versus cost of rework is always a very interesting debate, because typically when it's ductwork or plumbing, it's always gonna be more expensive to move a duct or a pipe than it is a, a drywall. And, but in this example, the reason that drywall was able to get 28% productivity increase is because they were actually framing the entire wall, including the openings of where the duct will in the future go through based on them, which again, uh, I know this doesn't sound weird, but you would never see that in this industry. It would always be the opposite order, but it's because they knew from them to that level of quality that that's how they were gonna install it. And if it was wrong, and they measured it against BIM, even if the mechanical installed uh, you know, incorrectly and the drywall installed correctly, that they'll probably have the drywall fix it because it is cheaper, but who would pay for it would be the mechanical. Because now you're using this coordinated model as um, what you're comparing against and say, and say you know, who's to blame is always kind of this finger pointing. And so we've never had um, a, a definitive answer of like what it should be. BIM is the opportunity to be the definitive, this is what it should be. You can't argue from a design side, you can't argue from a construction side, it's, it's always comparing back to that. But uh, that has to happen contractually, and it, it hasn't in this industry. So that's, that's usually, I mean, that's, that's a big 
Uh, so yeah, it's sort of an yeah. exception to the, the general rule in the industry, right? This it, is the norm. Yeah, it, it is. It definitely was an exception to the rule in 2009. It's still kind of an exception to the rule, but um, you are seeing more and more of it. So it, it is. It is increasing. Um, oh, but actually, I, will, I do want to touch on that last point because the last point here, so this is a great example of a shot of a laser scan. So has, has anyone uh, seen what a laser scanner looks like? Like these big honking, um, you usually see them out on highways, and they will emit out you know, millions of points per second rolling around. And what we're able to do in this situation here is each, each of this sort of clouded area that you see around the wall was a reflection of what was poured in the field. We had, were essentially uh, pouring concrete walls and we had to leave these sleeves. So you can see a little shadow there of uh, where that shadow is in that laser scan. And you can also see, if you follow this pipe, originally this pipe was coming over, straight down, across, and then through again, right to the same point here. But notice that had to move because what happened is in the field, when I was uh, walking out there, we realized that the rebar congestion in this area was not gonna work. We had to move them in the field because we didn't communicate, we didn't know, we, we discovered an issue, so this job wasn't perfect, but we used technology to identify it at least early enough and then re-coordinate, we created waste digitally in order to save time physically by moving that pipe around and over and back. So it, it is more expensive than we originally did it, but the fact that we had this coordinated and didn't have to spend time standing there and looking up in the field and going, well, crap, how are we going to do this now? You know, that, that's where all the cost and all the waste comes in. So, uh, you know, things like this, that like laser scanning, that used to be really expensive, our you know, return on investment is uh, almost, yeah, not even an issue anymore. Uh, what time will we have to do? Oh, okay. We're good. We, uh, so we're, we're going to jump into the part where, of like, how do you actually improve productivity? And I definitely want some ideas because, you know, again, uh, fresh eyes, kind of new, new approach to how do we solve this, this wicked problem of innovation in design and construction. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw a couple of stats at you again, and then we'll dive into the discussion. So this uh, World Economic Forum report is uh, another great report that I recommend you check out. But uh, the graphic here that I want to show talks about the, it's a survey of the different transformation areas that are required in the engineering and construction industry. And again, as much as uh, we, we think that the advancements of technology is what we need, really what we need is transformation of people, uh, the adoption of new technologies, materials, and tools, and industry collaboration. Um, I think the last one there, business models, is really interesting, especially, as you, again, as you look at mechanical design, uh, mechanical fabrication, mechanical installation, mechanical operation, uh, there's a huge opportunity for changes across those different verticals and, and better integration in different business models uh, that are going to change the industry. So very, again, very exciting time to be in the trades. And I think another thing I would like to note is that the very last one on the list, the least important, is creation of intellectual property. Because so much of this industry used to be around you know, the pride and the scars of, of the projects and, and the failures and mistakes that I made is what makes me a good builder. And so therefore, I'm going to hide those from everybody else because that's my competitive advantage. But in, in today's sort of Google, Wikipedia world, we're realizing that it's, it's not what you know. It's, it's how you <laughs> leverage what you know um, and, to, and that kind of continuous improvement, continuous learning that is really the new mindset. So it's good to see that the industry is recognizing that, is understanding that and is taking the next steps to, to reward the right activities uh, in the industry. Quick yeah. note on the uh, intellectual property is, that nowadays, it's, the uh, technology is changing so rapidly that intellectual property, unless you have something really dynamic or really uh, really unique, it's almost it's almost hard to, by the time you get a patent on something, the, the, the technology may have changed or the, the industry may have changed enough to where you move on to another, another thing, right? It's well, and, that, and that's why nobody wants to be in the hardware world. <laughs> yeah. Um, because yeah, like drone, even like a lot of the drone companies, you'll see they they stop making drones because the IP and the competitive is so hyper competitive mm -hmm. that they just focus on the software side. Um, and so, but it, and, and really, the the reality in this industry is that in design and construction, there isn't really intellectual property. It's a, it's a professional service. So we shouldn't be thinking about it as intellectual property. We should be thinking about it as a professional service that we're all sharing. And so, what is you know just like. Why would doctors not share their knowledge with each other? Of course they should. And I think engineers should be the same way too. Um, but this is a, another way of looking at a lot of those same technologies we were talking about on the other graphic 
Uh, but this places them a little bit differently in this matrix between the likelihood, so how, how uh, um, advanced is the technology itself. So you see drones is, is pretty far up there. It's a new technology, so it, it doesn't have a huge impact as far as like a, a, a disruption level or, or a, a true um, uh, high impact ROI, but it is very easy to adopt. And you're seeing a lot of them getting picked up, especially by GCs or, or 3D laser scanning. Another great example of something that uh, we just talked about that is uh, what we put in the category of just really a business barrier that all we need is the right business case and it's kind of a no-brainer to adopt. Um, so wireless monitoring, kind of the, the um, whether you're monitoring materials or equipment or people, uh, the 3D laser scanning and drones in that business barrier category. Um, the next one is, is the technology barriers, sort of at the bottom. So these are all the ones where uh, really co like contour crafting of buildings is, if anyone's ever seen the concrete printed houses, like in China, they're mm -hmm. 3D printing houses in like 24 hours. I mean, that, that's an example of contour crafting. Again, more of a technology barrier. Uh, Self-healing materials, same deal. 3D printing of components, you know, very cool possibilities, but I don't think in the world that we're in, that's, that's still more of a consumer product. Um, and then again, advanced building materials. It's all really in the materials realm that you see. Um, but this middle category is, is what's really interesting where the barrier is, is not the technology um, and, and, it's, and it's not really the business either. It's not, it's not a very quick, easy ROI. It's really this integration barrier. So big data analytics is all about can you integrate across your accounting and your estimating and your project management and your safety so that you're collecting data. Um, augmented reality, can you connect between uh, the, the geospatial positioning of what's in the 3D model versus what's in the field to have that level of accuracy between them? Uh, advanced project planning tools, well, how well are we actually talking to each other to plan differently and plan more effectively? You know, it's only as good as the weakest link. Same thing with real-time mo mobile collaboration, only as good as the weakest link. Uh, prefabricated building components, uh, absolutely the same way if you're dealing with multiple trades. Now, if you're just a mechanical contractor and you're, just, and, and you're going from your own design through fabrication, there's a lot of prefabrication opportunities. But the second you try and bring more companies in with different incentives, it gets really messy again. And then at the very top, which we've been talking about really the whole time, is integrated BIM. And this, this utopia of, man, if only we could have this, this Google Maps, Google Earth of our projects, with all the information that we need and, and nothing that we don't, and that we actually trust it, it'd be great. But um, it's, it, it really is, it's, it's this um, wishless item, this high potential that we all need to shoot for, and we will get there. It's sort of like the internet, right? You know, it's like the internet's gonna solve everything, but it also could take us all down. Um, but what is the ROI? So at the end of the day, uh, we're, we're gonna leave school, we're gonna enter the business world, and, and we, we've gotta show how we're making money. And this is a great kind of just simple example. Again, this is not mechanical, but this is um, uh, showing an example of, of laying a road. And that it's still the same fundamental activities of layout, of earth moving, of grading across the board. And, and you, could, you could probably substitute the same fundamental factors of uh, design through fabrication of a mechanical system. And uh, you can see from the technology construction they're reporting in this one-to-one -one comparison, 31% fewer man hours, 34% fewer equipment hours, 46% fewer project hours, and 37% less fuel, um, and then not to mention all the environmental benefits. So you've got all these great benefits that they're showing, but what I, what I think is really interesting, I'm gonna pause this one right here, because, uh, oh shoot, can I go back to it? There we go. Um, because in this part right here, um, what they're talking about is what is that payoff point? Because just because that technology is really cool doesn't mean we should use it on every single project. It is going to be more expensive. There is more planning. There is there is more upfront planning. So sometimes if it's really small and, and a quick hitter, it's not worth doing all this technology investment. And they figured out that the payoff point was about four miles. And so you ask a, a highway you know construction company how often they have projects more than four miles probably going to be every single job. So that's a pretty easy payoff point. But in, in your own situation, that may not be a very easy payoff point. It might be a very complicated payoff point. But the better that you can be sort of that, that data analyst to see what are the conditions in which we can pass this return on investment, that's, that's how we start to convince executives when we should use the technology. Uh, not, not just because it's cool, but because it's in our best business interest. 
Nathan, what was the difference between the two? So I'm assuming there's yeah. one standing on the bottom one, right? The so basically what, what they're, and in full transparency, this is a huge promotion for Caterpillar and all the technology that they use. But what they're talking about is uh, le leveraging both integrated layout. So notice how much shorter the layout time was because they were using, uh, most likely in this case, GPS, because it was a uh, fairly large area. But you know the earth moving was going to be definitely GPS led earth moving. So someone is pushing the the um, the tractor, but they're not actually moving the arms. The mar arms are being controlled by GPS, so they're making up time there. Uh, the uh, I guess the gradient I think is the next one is where again they're so they're all they're basically showing off all the different integrated like GPS and layout technologies that once they have that information in CAD or in uh, GIS mobile information systems they can more quickly lay that out. And so that, that's essentially showing the efficiencies of if the design doesn't change and if everything is perfect, when you use this layout technology and, and this earth moving technology, you'll save that much. Um, and, but it, it's, the reason I play that is it is fundamentally based on perfect world conditions. So it's like it's great to use those as, and think of those as use cases of how do you prove a return on investment of other ideas, other innovations. Um, but that you also have to actually test them and see, you know, how often do you get the same result? Because um, oftentimes it is, it is different conditions that we run into. Um, the uh, we, we talked about this a ton already, but uh, there's a great quote from John Macrover who uh, wrote this report for the American Society for Civil Engineers back in 2003, actually, called "Follow the Money: What Really Drives Technology Innovation in Construction." And he says, virtually everyone in the construction supply chain works on contracts where the incentive is to maximize their gain at the expense of others. And so I, I always have to continue to come back to those that are in the industry that uh, will, will come up with all kinds of wild excuses why they can't use technology uh, or, or why they don't want to share data or do a lot of these more uh, transparent, uh, apparently disruptive things. And it usually comes down to this underlying fact that they don't want to admit to you. Um, and just, just know that um, and, and, and try to understand how much this impacts the decisions that get made in this industry, both on design and on the construction side. And that it's, it's really our responsibility to, to reshape how we interact between designers, uh, engineers, contractors, and uh, trade contractors and, and vendors as well. Because they all have a huge value to bring. They are all specialists in what they do. Um, and, and, you know, we should. We talk a lot about respect from perspective as a, as a theme for um, how we really needed to treat both the design and engineering in, in the industry. So um, the last part of how to improve productivity is that, again, we, we've talked about all these problems that we really have to overcome in order to reach this utopia of how technology is going to transform construction. And I mentioned earlier we're going to talk about roadblocks or barriers. So really quickly, a roadblock would be something that, as you can see here, you, you, you're not going to move a roadblock. Um, you can't go through a roadblock, you have to figure out ways to go around. And going around might not be as efficient as going through, um, but because it's a roadblock, something you can't control, you have to. So in our IPD world uh, that I was on, where all contracts went away, everybody was collaborating freely, and we had virtually no roadblocks except for public policy, except for the government OSHPOD, you know, inspectors, that they became the roadblock, that then we had to be creative to think about ways to go around. But otherwise, everything else was just a barrier. Um, so a barrier is going to be things like investment in technology, uh, uh, the, the you know our conception of the return on investment in technology, uh, our ability to want to track rework in order to improve rework. These are, are mostly mental blocks or mental barriers, um, or or interpersonal barriers. With you know uh, a lot of, a lot of times you know uh, managers will not see value in. Uh, the use of technology and, and younger engineers will have to kind of explain and sell up to them why they should. Those are great examples of barriers where you can say, oh, well, he just doesn't get it, and, and call that a roadblock and go around them. But really, especially when, the, when they're inside your own company, those are those conversations, those, are those crucial conversations that um, for those that are really going to excel as, as young leaders in the industry are able to have those, those conversations with project managers, convince them why their way was right, and pro parts that probably still are, but that there are different ways of thinking about it, um, and that you can sell both the, the business side of it and the process side of it. Um, 
Let's see here. So, uh, and then the last one, this kind of funky slide here, uh, is is sort of showing what a lot of these adoptions of technology in the industry look like, and and what it often feels like uh, for those that are going through it. That you know, a lot of times uh, when technology decisions get made across companies, or as things roll out, and again, we we reach that peak of inflated expectations, that idea that everybody's just going to immediately adopt it, and we, we call that the uniform or sorry, the unicorn. Uh, adoption curve uh, because uni unicorns don't exist, and, uh, and and more often than not, uh, again, there's a great John Cotter uh, international that talks about how most of these technology implementations internally uh, fail 70% of the time, and so that it's it's not that uh, you want to avoid that 70% failure. It's that how do how do you as an individual, how do companies accept that failure is just part of the process, and that we're learning from that failure, we're, we're failing fast and measuring from it. Um, and then going through that A3 process and assess a line advance and getting past that tipping point, um, recognizing that from, from our current productivity, we're probably going to be oops, uh, less productive uh, before we're more productive. And the better we can set our sights for that, the more realistic we are, uh, the faster we'll, we'll exceed expectations and uh, improve productivity and uh, return on investment in the industry. So um, I think for the most part, uh, that was it. I have. There are some other slides and examples uh, for anyone is, that is interested in anything specifically to, uh, again, material tracking or integrated scheduling, performance tracking. These are things that typically come up when we are talking to other mechanical contractors across the country. If there's any you know, random questions, or we can dive into these topics, or otherwise I'll leave it open for you guys for any, any thoughts or questions. Can you explain how the, um, you, were, you were alluding to the contractors, uh, I guess some of the, um, I guess they might have some financial losses if, let's say the project, I don't, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but if the project is too well designed, right, uh, you know, because they do make a percentage of some of, or they make money on rework and things like that, right? Can, can you explain how that works? For this yeah, project? so so there, there are a couple different incentives, and especially from a mechanical, well, let's put the mechanical contractor hat on right now, because more often than not, a mechanical contractor is going to need to bid their cost of work, all their design, fab engineering, under one general lump sum. And so in that case, uh, once they ask what that number is and they agree to that number, it's, it's a closed door race to the finish line of as cheaply as I can do this, then all my profit margin is, is above that and that's where I make my money. So that, that would be the traditional hard bid approach. Um, and, and that's actually, I'm not against that approach. I mean, that, that creates a lot of ad adversarial relationships and deception and a lot of things that give the industry a bad name. But it's actually more competitive than, uh, uh, say, a very vanilla design build contract that says, okay, we're, we're gonna collaborate, guys, but we're, we're not gonna have any incentive to collaborate. And usually, when, when you say, you know, okay, we should do this thing, and you write it in a document, but you don't actually change the organization to implement those. Uh, it, we, you know, we uh, fail, and we the projects run into challenges um, that that uh, give those more progressive approaches of that name. So, um, I'm trying to go back to what your original question was, because we're talking about the different contract types. And yeah, and I was, you know, I, if you could explain to the students how the contractors make, um, you know, are are basically making additional money compared to a project that might rely more on bin. That's right, change orders. Change orders. Yes. Yeah, so so thank you. That's what we're talking about. We're talking change order. That's what it was. So, and and in that world, yeah. So a change order would now increase that that number that you hit every time you get a change order. You can increase that number, and so that's where a lot of this technology, this data, I I keep trying to tell mechanical contractors in the industry is. That data is your friend. You know, it used to be that you were worried about being tracked up for rework or tracked up for something you could get in trouble for. But now it's well, actually, the way a lot of these contracts are worked, if you can really well track the impact that happened to you that wasn't your fault, and you have all this data backup for it, nobody's going to argue with you and and cut down your hundred thousand dollar claim down to a seventy five thousand dollar claim. You'll get all hundred thousand. So that's a great way to increase profit and to prove a return on investment. But you know, it's, it's not necessarily a standard uh, return on investment that everyone would calculate. You have to kind of tell that story for an executive for them to go, oh, oh okay, I get why we would actually maybe want to do it that way. Because it's, it's still counterintuitive for this industry, for sure. I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> well, what's your feeling of the 
general contractor versus the construction manager versus the uh, Ooh, uh, specifying engineer. Yeah. And the, the other, the complicated issue more, all that you see around this area, the general contractor has his buyers, construction manager, they end up being two GCs. And you say garbage in, garbage out, there's a lot of garbage Well, in and what, what's even the difference between a construction manager and a general contractor? There is. Because <laughs> they're both like this. Well, appa apparently to today, a general contractor percent. is a construction manager that self-performs. Yeah. And, and, if a and if a GC doesn't self-perform, then they're a construction manager. Why is the industry starting that way? Uh, deep job construction. <laughs> My ex company. I actually think a lot, and a lot of the design build contracts did change what that was because they're not this is probably going to be over some folks' heads, but um, when design build did come out in the early 90s and really became prolific because GC said, uh, we'll, we'll show you all these other numbers, just make sure we get our you know one to three percent, which was just silly that they would take jobs for that low. But what they would also do is they would guarantee that they had a certain percent of self-perform work that they could make probably 15% below the line on. And so they were actually commoditizing themselves out. So the GC of today makes most of their money through self-perform work, not through the general contracting practice because they've commoditized themselves. And then true construction managers now have to try and separate, okay, what is the difference between, a CM is really someone that oversits the best interest of the owner in a very large design build job and plays the referee between, but in that case, they usually just become another cog in the wheel of the garbage in, garbage out. Correct. And, and because they're traditional CMs, not the, the future, like I, I would love to redefine what the CM of the future is. Well, what I'm saying is the specified engineers of the yesteryear, you know, going back in the 70s, 80s, they were good. They gave you a good plan, gave a layout. A chance for extras and change orders were minimal compared to what you have right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, I, I'm not in the contract, but I, I personally blame the GC and the construction manager for that issue. And when you say specifying engineer, uh, well, line, point blank, I'm on the four inch pipe, reduced down to four to three, everything's spelled out. Oh, a, a true design consultant under an architect that's doing the engineering. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, gotcha. Um, did you have a comment related? Or, well, um, I think you're somewhat misleading students not intentionally, but there's construction managers that are at risk, and there's construction managers that are just work at 3%. Great point. The construction manager at risk, he guaranteed a price. I understand Good that. point. Yeah, let's go back to, because yeah, we didn't. Here, yeah, let's spend some time on this one, because you're absolutely right. And then see on that risk. Yeah. Right. Good. 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 Or, or, um, so yeah, because on that point, what we're talking about is in a design build uh, sense, what we were talking about was a CM sitting right here and playing you know, this role what really should be the owner's role. And that's why I say high owner involvement, it's usually a CM, whereas, yeah, you're right, you need to clarify if it's a CM at risk, and then- the owners will retain a CM for the, for the reason that they, they want a buffer between themselves and the contract and the owner. Yeah, exactly. To, to protect their interest, and whether they do or not, it, 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 it depends on and so that's, that's where I say it, like what I meant by like sometimes the old school is the better way. Truly a CM at risk is kind of that there are correct incentives where the builder is truly managing the design and they are taking on that risk and it funnels more or less, I mean there may be exceptions to that. I will tell you though, <laughs> I will tell you though, the best projects we've ever done, bar not design build. We're, we're design build? Okay. No, design build, when we designed them and built them, and, Total collaboration with the owner. Yeah. And uh, I assure you that that was all we Absolutely. To answer Regis' question, I think one of the major problems today, Regis, is engineers have become a commodity. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I'm saying, and you don't get. When Nick hit the bottom, that when, when Nick Locke was an engineer, he designed everything. Correct. Today, yeah. Today, the, the owners are saying, we only want to spend this much or this, that, and the other thing. So they then go out and bid to the engineers, the engineers are like contractors, they're yeah. bidding on something. When they run out of money at 70% of the design, it goes out the door. Yeah. It will make it the contractor's problem, and that's when the fun starts. Well, how many projects have uh, you, you've been around? Uh, do you do uh, CM at risk, though? Uh, I mean, Especially the industry. Well, 
Most projects today, like highway projects and so on. No, but I'm saying our mechanic would. Well, but the hotels, things like that, most of them are CM at risk. Really? They have, they'll, wow. he, he brings up an excellent point. They, 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 they pay total their cost, then he put 3% on it. Yeah. And yeah, it doesn't sound like much, but the truth of the matter is most mechanical contractors want the 2%. But the issue is that they're at risk and they want to try to keep up. The imperative is to keep the changes, to keep it on budget, on time, yep. so that they can, so that the, the facility can be revenue generating within the, the financial scope of the owner. Absolutely. Um, uh, just a couple of questions later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on, buddy. <laughs> As you can tell, I knew we'd end up getting into the contracts because you know, so much of this at the end of the day comes into what is the incentive to make the process better. And we've got all these different mechanisms to change the process. And some are good and bad in other situations. And the, and the well, better what, we understand. What is really yeah. starting to take off, though, is one of the bottom right hand corners. Well, exactly. The integrated project delivery. It, it, that, yeah. That's one we're going to talk about next week on a pretty large project in, in Pittsburgh. And we'll be interested to see, in fact, I'll talk to you later about that, how we, we might be able to make questions. I was going to say, yeah, I'll, I'll give you some good material for it. Because, um, yeah, because it, it, it is still fairly new. and. And this idea, this this sort of utopian idea that the owner, the designer, the builder can be sharing risk and reward. Yeah. But the risk is handled a couple ways. You either accept it, you mitigate it, or you insure against it. And and so when, as, as soon as you can define what the risk is before it becomes a major problem, you, you know, the, the project overall is, is better is better. Better, their interest is better retained. Yeah, well, in, in these cases, it's you insure against it, you uh, you own it, and I think you accept it in, well, in that in that that's, order, probably. That's essentially right. Yeah, because because they, it's all about the, the cultural acceptance that, hey, guys, we're in this together that makes IPD work. See, at risk, you know it's on you, well, so you, you own that too, risk. The owner will, you'll have a number, and the owner will say, any savings will share 50 I remember doing one for IBM, and it was, it was yeah. uh, very, very well. So was your design bill to have shared savings? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and so I said specifically on this one, no said shared before, savings. You said it real fast, but so yeah. you don't have shared savings. Yeah, exactly. You have a traditional problem. And, and so that's where I got this whole idea of like required collaboration. But like design build projects that do not have shared savings and have this idea of, oh, you, thou shall collaborate. It's like, no, and nobody's they gonna do that. They won't collaborate, because yeah, that, that's the adage of who has the money has the, has the power. Follow the money. They, they don't want to share it. Absolutely, so they're, they're absolutely. Not, they're, not, they're not gonna collaborate. <laughs> um, anything not related to contracts? <laughs> yeah. the, the output from BIM, uh, I guess my question is, can, can all contractors handle BIM now? You know, mm. or is, or I'm assuming there's a certain amount of uh, learning curve. Depends on who too. asks them. Right. If the owner asks them if they do it, of course they're going to say yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there are some there are some studies out of like BIM competency across. I think I want to say that this year we're supposed to be at like 75% industry adoption, which that doesn't mean 75% of all people are using BIM. It means 75% of all companies are doing something with BIM. So it's, it's much less than what it seems like it is. So not fully integrated. It's no, but if, if you are a contractor doing 100 million or more a year, you probably have a dedicated bin role, or at least you should in your company by this point. Contracts are required. <laughs> yeah, okay. So you got a spec written around it. No, oh, yeah. You can't bid it. The specs come out. You better be bidding. And, right, and so here it lies some of that garbage in, garbage out, is you'll see requirements for it, and then Connor go, oh yeah, I can do that, but yeah, then yeah. they'll just outsource it. Yeah. And it's sort of this backwards, you know, not good process to get it done. And that's why I mentioned the you know, BIM world in India, because a lot of that does get, get outsourced. Oh, um, and, and, and not to say that, you know, there, there are very effective ways to leverage a 24-hour work cycle, and I'm not against outsourcing certain, you know, digital work because it's more efficient. Um, and, and effective, but I think the idea that it's not my thing, like I'm, uh, I'm not a math person, I'm just gonna let someone do my homework for me, you know, that's the fastest way to get disrupted. Because um, it's, it's at the core of what's gonna differentiate companies is not just that they say that they do it, but they're actually better builders because of it. And that's what we're seeing the mechanical guys proving they are better builders because of it. 
you're not seeing as many GCs saying that they're better builders because of it, but they do at least understand the theory of the value. But but the GC's value to BIM is much more of that weakest link. It's only as good as, as the, the one contractor that's uh, not good at it. Whereas if you're a really savvy mechanical contractor, you know, it doesn't really matter who you work with because you control your own destiny. So that's what's really nice about those that are in the trade contractor world is that the incentive to do BIM is so much greater because uh, if, if you're already trying to integrate your uh, design, engineering, detailing, fabrication, whatever, and, and that's what we're seeing is a lot of these larger mechanical firms are swallowing up design companies because the design is becoming commoditized. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it comes out. So. Are there any softwares that are free for students, for instance? Or? Yes. Um, so I know last year, Audis made a big announcement about their academic program. And I think, let's talk after this, because I know most of the contacts at the big software firms that are like the university partner people. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the exact answer, but there are definitely a lot more programs where they want to get either very subsidized or free. Um, so I'll, I'll make sure they do that. Is Trimble part of that? So Trimble SketchUp is a great example of one, just really you know basic stuff or just working stuff up and right. visualizing, um, and then yeah, that's a good one. And then and, and even uh, I'm trying to think what you guys would yeah yeah like that one or Technical Bim site or any of those yeah there's some free ones out there um, and because uh, are you potentially guys looking at putting together a, a curriculum for a well we were talking about maybe putting together a minor at first yeah something along those lines I think at the very least maybe MCAA we could have a you know half a day workshop and, and learn the bare basics it, kind of thing. Well, and the uh, thing is too, uh, I may connect you with Fernanda Lecce at University of Texas who came over there. So she's a Carnegie Mellon grad and oh. um, teaches a BIM class that she started at UT. Oh, um, and she may have some great curriculum or whatever and you know, we're plus I'm sure she doesn't mind. <laughs> Sharon, right. I mean, you can pick and choose from that what makes, I mean, it's gonna be more of like a civil architectural engineering Okay. Um, version of it, yeah. but uh, you could even take you know take parts and pieces of it, and yeah. we could even work together on yeah you know, like what would be a um, university level uh, mechanical engineering slash fabrication specific in class because it would really be, be the supply chain mm -hmm. of um, design through fabrication and what are the, the tools and the technologies and the integrations. Yeah, I'd want to yeah, do that. you guys. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, Zoom back out in case there's anything else that gets primed. But, um, Reed, how do you think we convince executives to spend more money on technology? What do you think is preventing that? Because I know that's the biggest thing I face that I can't, I can't fix yet. I can't answer that. There's so many different <laughs> uh, reasons. I think uh, history is part of it. You know, you have a crew of uh, fitters, plumbers, superintendents who are working at you. For a long, long time, they're a stay owner of the company. Uh, our, our industry is old. I mentioned it earlier when I was talking. We do have a lot of young, good young kids coming up through the trades that are in highly technical, you know, with the systems and everything like that. There's a gap in our business uh, between the age of 25 and 50. So a lot of 50 and older. I said it earlier, we need young kids in our industry, in all phases of it, good young kids in our industry. Uh, I, it's all technology now, there's no doubt about it. And you're not going to teach full time, there's the majority of them do tricks. They don't teach old dog good tricks. So and, uh, how are folks getting internships? I'm curious, because I didn't see many hands for internships. Well, we just started this. We, we oh, had okay. five last year. <laughs> okay, so you had five individually. We, we started late last year. We just got it going at the tail end when we started our student chapter here. Cool. And uh, we just got registered, as a matter of fact, a couple of months back with the MCAA. So, uh, but uh, we had 18 to 19 applications, and we did end up with five uh, internships last year. And some of the contractors already had connections with Penn State to, to have internships, too. So. I talked to the contractors that did that, and we'll weasel them over to Robert Morris next year, hopefully, you know. Because uh, Penn State was the closest campus that had uh, the internships going before. So we're working on that. So for what it's worth, our engineering students have to have what we call an engineering practice. They have to have an internship in order to graduate. In some cases, you know, if, if we can't combine an internship.
internship, they'll do a project or something along those lines. But most of the students get an internship before they graduate. I think Professor Stevens, uh, what, what class is your class? Is it intro? Intro. Yeah, okay, so, so intro to engineering are freshman level students. And then uh, we got a dynamics class in here, so uh, nice. junior level, right? So uh, some of the juniors probably should have had an internship by now, but, uh, and some of you guys did. But um, yeah, so, uh, so the, uh, obviously the freshman level, they probably wouldn't have been yeah. looking for it yet, right? It's okay. But um, yeah, so we do have to have an internship in Adelaide, you know. We, um, at NCAA has done a great job with, with trying to, to get internships and spread the word around. It'll be better this year. Now yeah. that we've got the full year to work with, and you know, like we say, we've got it to tell them next year. So we'll, we'll do a lot better job this year. Too. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, well, it's all predicated on work, as everybody knows, but work yeah. will be fine around here. Awesome. Work's good in the area. So. Yeah, if anyone wants to internship in Chicago, let me know. Yeah. yeah. I may have some hard team opportunities next summer. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> um, Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I have a question. First, before people start leaving, can I make a quick MCA announcement? Please. All right. Awesome sauce. So my name is Alexandra. I'm the current president of our MCA uh, chapter here. So if you have any questions about it itself, you can come to me. I'm going to hang out around after this. Our next big project is going to be touring the new sports um, construction site. So we'll get some hands-on, full we'll sight-on look at it. So if you have any questions, come to me, please. Thank you. And then as for a question yeah. for, like, the sake of integrating, because I got into this because my father's a contractor, so he's in that 50 range. So he handles the, the old timers way of doing it, and then I use the technology and we work together. But a lot of people have a real hard time doing that. I can do it because he, he's my dad, but someone else trying to do it for him would never work. So uh, what you're describing is in this concept called bi bi-directional or symbiotic mentorship and it's, it's this recognition of both sides bring a value it's just a different value and uh, it, it, it starts with the younger age recognizing that the, the old farts actually do know something that we don't know and that all that experience and all those you know painful memories actually are valuable <laughs> and, and might be might not be as easy as we think to share and to express uh, and at the same time they need to recognize that these, these digital skills you know, are, are very valuable and that they're not gonna be as quick to pick them up and that if they can at least just learn to look over a shoulder and understand what, like BIM especially. I, I talk to old superintendents all the time, they go, I'm not expecting you to be able to flip around in it and, and do all the doohickeys and be a professional, but at least look at it and know what you're looking at. Don't just see a bunch of colored watches and, and only be thinking in that 2D world because there are so many more people that are more comfortable in the 3D world, and you do get more information when you finally know what you're looking at, but it's, yeah, it's that, that cognitive um, understanding of it that is kind of what you need to do on their side. Um, awesome. Anything, man, everybody's, this is good. Hold on, we made a good time. Um, so, I'm, I mean, I'm gonna stick around if anybody wants to dive into any more specific topics or like career path discussions or anything along those lines, because at least I know I was asking a lot of those questions um, at this point. Uh, if anyone wants to talk about them now, great. Otherwise, we can talk about them separately. All right. Anything you want to add, Tony? No, I, I mean, if there's any questions, obviously we'll field those. Um, for now, I guess we'll go ahead and give you a round of applause. Yeah. Here. Thank you.